So those kind of typify, if you were uh, out in the world asking the question, which is exactly what they did there, those are a lot of the answers you would get in terms of, of um, what the truth uh, is. Um, if, you, if you generally go, and, and honestly, there's probably some folks in this room, um, and you've even been in church a while, you still kind of have those questions kind of going around your head as well. And so when you kind of look at this question about is, is Christianity too narrow, there's kind of two opposites, if you would, views of religion. Not just Christianity, but two opposite views of, of uh, religion uh, itself. Um, and one of the primary views is this idea that, that you kind of, you kind of, one person kind of said it, and that is that all roads lead to the truth. And a lot of times you'll get a picture kind of like this next one coming up, right? Uh, you know, and these are just three of the big ones, but there are all, all these roads that, that basically uh, Christianity is narrow because it's truth that it claims it's just really part of the overall truth. And that, and that they're all talking about God. They just have a different aspect. And some of you may remember, we talked about this early in the year. I showed you this illustration of, oh, actually, um, Mahatma Gandhi kind of sums this idea up. He is quoted as saying, The soul of religion is one, but it is encased in a multitude of forms. He wrote that in uh, the paper that he put together called The Young uh, India. All right. Now, this illustration kind of shows you, you know, if somebody was uh, talking about it, this is what they would say it is. Right. You've probably heard this. There's an elephant and all these are blind people and they all have their hand on a different part of the elephant. Right. And so one says, you know, you ask him, what is an elephant? One says it's a rope. The other one says it's a fan. The other one says it's a spear. It's a snake. It's a tree. It's a wall. Right. And then and then, of course, us, the uh, philosopher would say, well, who is right? And the answer would be all of them are right. Right? And then they go back to and see all these roads lead to the same answer. Everyone is right. Everyone's truth is valid because they have a piece of the real truth. Of course, as I said before, um, this sounds good unless the elephant sits down. And then it matters what's true, what an elephant really is and what he's not. Because if you're at the wrong place of elephant when he sits down, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. See, the, the problem with this whole, whole idea that all roads lead there is, um, is something called the law of contradiction. So the law of contradiction is a principle in logic, just, just thinking, that a thing cannot at the same time both be and not be of a specific kind. In other words, this can't be a podium and not a podium at the same time or in, in a specific manner. It can't be both, both black and not black. Right? It can be multiple colors, but it can't be, you can't say this one color is both this color and not this color at the same time. It's a law of contradiction. Right? And, and by the way, most of, you know, when you talk about this, there's the philosophy. So the whole, the whole all roads lead to the same place is a great philosophy. But you live your life, you depend on the car you drive, you depend on, on the nutrition and stuff. The, most of your life, you're depending on people that actually believe in this law. <laughs> that, that two things can't be true, and, and they follow very specific things. And so if you apply this to religion, there are contradictory beliefs about God. For instance, Hindus acknowledge multitudes of gods and goddesses. Buddhists say that there's no deity at all. New Age spirituality follow, followers believe that they themselves are God. Muslims believe in a powerful but unknowable God, and Christians believe a loving God who created us to know him, right? So if all religion, uh, religions are worshiping the same God, then you got to think about that, okay? So just, just one instance. So let's just say New Age spirituality teaches that everyone should come to, to center on a cosmic consciousness, but... It would require Islam to give up their one God, Hinduism to give up their numerous gods, and Buddhism to establish that there is a God in order for that to happen. Now, there may be various aspects of God, but at some point, if God exists, we talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago, if God exists, someone is right and someone is wrong, all paths do not lead there, logically speaking, which leads us to which leads us to the other, other opposing view 
that no one can know the truth. One is, you know what, everyone's got a hand on the truth. It's all true. And the other one's, you can't know truth at all. It's kind of like back to Malcolm's illust ill illustration. You know what, some people say, you know what, it doesn't really matter what you take to be cured, you'll be cured. And then another person says, you know what, there's just no way of knowing. There's so many different opinions, there's just no way of knowing. And so in this view, where no one can know the truth, Christianity is too narrow because it claims to have the truth that applies to everyone. And, and this is, especially in the West, in the United States, this is a growing one. This is the problem with Christianity, right, is that they claim to know truth, and we know now there is no truth. No one is right. Nietzsche kind of uh, illustrated this or had the same kind of idea. In his quote, he says, Truths are illusions of which we have forgotten that they are illusions. He wasn't a big fan of truth. He says, no one's truth is valid. Why? Because truth is grounded in personal perspective. Now, remember, Nietzsche is a philosopher. So he, he lived in a world of ideas. The problem is, is that truth is necessary for life, which quite frankly is why you're here. We're looking for truth. It is a necessity of life. Let me just give you a simple illustration, okay? If you're about to step out in the street, do you look both ways? Right? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you do. Why? Because you want to know the truth about whether or not a car is coming. And it matters. And, and if, you, if you deny that truth and you just walk out the street whenever, right, we call someone and say, this person needs help. Because they're not seeing reality. Because there are real, not imagined, there are real consequences for that. There are real consequences for that. So, for instance, if there is no truth... And what I'd like you to do for the rest of this time, since it's not true, is hold your breath. You will not die. It's not true. There is no truth. It's ridiculous. Because in every case that we know of, when people, now some people can go longer, can swim underwater longer than other people, but eventually every person needs to breathe. Everyone needs to breathe. And that has shown itself time and time and time and time and time again. And your life actually depends on truths. You need water, you need air, you need shelter, you need on and on and on and on and on. So this whole idea that there, you know, no one can really know truth is, is an interesting philosophy, but, but you can't, maybe you can live some areas of your life in that, and we'll talk about that. But to live life completely that way, again, we call those folks deluded. Mentally unhealthy. Because they can't see what everybody else clearly can see. So in answering this question about whether Christianity is too narrow, uh, my answer would be this. Christianity is both narrow and broad. Christianity is both narrow, but it's also very broad. All right, so I'm going to go to the scriptures and just show because that's, that's where Christianity gets its truth from, right, is the scriptures. And say, okay, where, how does this idea come out? All right, and so I'm gonna, I wanna, we're going to start with this idea of that Jesus is going to talk about. He's going to talk about the narrow gate. We're, we're going to talk, he's going to use an illustration, a lot like Malcolm used an illustration. Jesus is going to use an illustration. But what I want to do is I want to I give you a little bit of the context before I, I get there. We don't have time to read the whole thing. So let me just give you a little context of what's happened. Okay, Jesus comes across a blind man, and he decides he's going to heal him. But what he does is, it's very interesting, he doesn't do this all the time. He takes some dirt, and he wets the dirt, and he makes a little mud, and he puts the mud on his eyes, and then he tells him to go wash. The guy goes, washes his eyes, so he goes away from Jesus, he washes his eyes, and he can see. And he'd been blind from birth. We don't know how old he is, but the idea is that he's, he's a, an adult now, Okay. And so people are excited about this and about what happened, and so they tell the religious leaders. Just like I'm assuming if you, if you came across somebody who was doing miraculous things, but, but um, maybe you did things a little bit different than your church did, or the Trinity Church did, you might come to me and go, hey, pastor, is this on the up and up? 
So they go to the, they go to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees bring them in, and they kind of get the, uh, they get the story, okay? The interesting thing is, they, don't, they, do, they do not look at that he was healed. They're upset because Jesus did two things that you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a holy day of worship, right? That it's taught, by the way, in the Hebrew Scriptures, right? The idea of resting on the Sabbath is taught uh, the Old Testament, what we call the Hebrew, the Hebrew Scriptures. And so, first of all, Jesus worked when he created mud, Okay? That was work, which you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And then Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And they consider that work as well. And so they're a little upset. Now, the problem is this guy is seeing. So the, first of all, they're like, you know what? He probably wasn't really blind. So they call his parents in, right? And his parents come in. Now, his parents know something's going on here. They don't want to get in trouble. And they're like, what we'll tell you is this. He was born blind. And as long as he lived with us... He was blind, but he's an adult now. Uh, but in terms of how he got healed, you need to talk to him. They're covering their back. And so they bring him back, and they begin to investigate uh, again. And they basically say, you know what, this Jesus fella is a sinner. And the blind guy says, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. What I do know is this. I was blind, and now I see. I was blind, and now I see. And um, there's this kind of this back and forth. And basically, they get their feelings hurt because Jesus is doing something against what they teach. Now, the interesting thing is what they teach is narrower than what the Bible teaches, than what the scriptures teach. They're the ones that narrowed it. And so they basically tell this guy, get out... Get out of our sight. As a matter of fact, that's why the parents, it says, were quiet, because, because they were kicking people out of the synagogue. They couldn't even worship if you kind of cross the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that time, right? And just, by the way, just in that day is the same as this day. You have folks, religious leaders, that are good folks, and you got some folks that are bad folks. And these were some of the bad folks, and that doesn't mean everybody was like that. So, so they're, he, they throw him out. He's rejected from his Jewish faith, if you, if you would, and then he comes across Jesus, and Jesus uh, begins this parable. He begins this example of something that they're all familiar with, about how a shepherd uses a couple examples. A shepherd protects the sheep, okay? So in the first scenario, and I'll, and I'll read this. In the first scenario, what happens is a bunch of shepherds get together, and they put all at night, and they put all their sheep together, and there's this huge enclosure, usually with sticks and branches and stuff like this, right, with one opening. And they all put their sheep into the pen at night. And then one person guards the gate. And then the shepherd, that way one person stays up at night and everybody else can sleep, right? And then that person who stayed up all night, they can sleep during the day. So then each shepherd then comes and gets their sheep in the morning. That's the first scenario. The second scenario is you take your sheep then out of that pen at night, out into the field. And a lot of shepherds in the field would set up another temporary structure because if they sense danger, they saw a wolf on a horizon or something like that, they would gather up their sheep and put them in the pen to protect them. So there was only one way to get to the sheep. That was out in the field. So Jesus uses this everyday thing that everybody's familiar with um, to kind of address what's going on here. So picking up in uh, John um, chapter 10, verse 7. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. So he's liking himself to this gate. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, verse 9. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So he uses this analogy. The first time he says that he's the gate, it's, it's that shared pen at night, right? And Jesus says that, that I am the gate for the sheep. In other words, there's, this, there's this, this, this one place. Now, one of the reasons that they did the sheep at night wasn't just wolves. It was thieves. It was people who wanted to steal sheep, right? This was the carjackings of the day. They didn't have cars, so the value was animals, and so people would try to grab the sheep at night, and in order, if the, if the 
uh, someone's guarding the gate, the only way into the pen is to go over the wall to steal the sheep. The thing is that even when they got over the wall in the sheep, what was interesting is that you imagine four, five, six, whatever shepherds put their sheep into the pen. It's a mess. And you're like, how in the world are they going to? The interesting thing is in the morning, a shepherd can come and they can do their own little hoo-wee, hoo-wee. And their sheep knows their voice and come out. And then another shepherd would have something else kind of going on. But when the thief goes in, the sheep just scatter because this is a stranger. And that's his illustration. He, what he's saying is, is that there's a, there's a comparison here. See, these other folks are just thieves and robbers, kind of like those other doctors in Malcolm's thing. They're just thieves and robbers. They're just trying to, they're just trying to copy it. They have all their other reasons, but they're just trying to copy it. He says, I am the true shepherd. And guess what? People who are really seeking the true shepherd know my voice. They know my voice. And the second time Jesus says that he is the gate, now he's, he's using the illustration of out in the fields, right? In the safe enclosure out in the field, because he says these, these sheep will be what? Saved. They will go in and out. If you're out in the fields, you go in and out of the pen. You don't just stay there overnight. You go in and out of the pen, and they will find pasture. They will be fed well, because that's the, that's the idea. And the result of him being the shepherd is, is this idea that the sheep are safe from danger. They can freely go uh, in and out. They can move around. There's a certain amount of freedom, and they will find what, they're, what they desire, the, the sustenance that they desire. Now, the thieves' goal, he says, is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says his goal is to, have abundant, is to give abundant life. His goal for the, for the sheep is clear, that they may enjoy and thrive. Whereas thieves, ultimately, they either want to steal the sheep for their own profit, they want to destroy uh, the sheep, again, for their own profit. Right? There's a contrast and then he goes in and does the same thing. There's another, there's a second contrast, starting in verse 11, and he's, Jesus again says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's the one who protects them. If that wolf comes, the shepherd's the one who goes out and protects the sheep. He meets the wolf. The hired hand is not the shepherd. Somebody you pay, you know, so you can have a, a time off or whatever, who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So again, here's the contrast. In, the first one, in, in the, this contrast, Jesus is the good shepherd just like the first one. But the thing about we find out about the shepherd in this one is that the shepherd actually lays his, not does he protect the sheep, not does he the gate, but he is the shepherd that lays his life down for the sheep. Because he owns them, they're his. There's ownership there. Right? It goes back to the very, very weak one, right? Where our purpose comes from, what we were created for, and that we were created by God. Second of all, he cares for them. In contrast, second contrast, there's the hired hand. Now, in the context, you know who the hired hand is? It's the Pharisees. The Pharisees, God entrusts, and, and by, and, in modern context, the pastor. I'm a hired hand. I hate this, but that's what it's saying. I don't own the sheep. You are not mine. You belong to the Lord God. But I'm the hired hand. And so when the wolf comes, right, and you see this, you see this among, among under shepherds like myself, um, who have not been completely changed, that are in it for the wrong reasons, and when it gets hard, they're out. Right? They're not the shepherd, they're not the owner, so they run when the wolf comes. Because they don't really care about the sheep. And therefore the wolf snatches or the wolf scatters the sheep. And what he's saying is these religious leaders, right, they are the hired hand. And they're not really here to protect the sheep. And the, and the obvious thing is, is that here you have this individual who was blind and now they can see. And all they're thinking about is protecting themselves and their reputation and their authority. They're not thinking about him at all. Now, what, what, what I want you to get out of this is that, 
is that when Jesus claims to be the gate, when he require, claims to be the owner, that's pretty exclusive, y'all. That's a narrow gate. I can't get around that. You want to know if Christianity is narrow? Yes. Jesus says it more plainly in another place. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to God or the Father except through me. You can't get more exclusive than that. Jesus' essence is saying there is no other way. Full disclosure. I can't soften it because that's what the Bible says. The gate, it's narrow. There's only one gate in this huge, no matter how big the enclosure is, there's only one gate. And Jesus says that he is the gate. However, however, in fairness, there, he's the gate, but there's a wide invitation. A wide invitation. Earlier in, uh, John writes the, this story. Earlier he wrote Jesus' words who says this in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, notice the scope, the world, that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's what Jesus said he came for, right? That they may have abundant life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The whole world is invited. He is the gate, but the whole world is invited. The gate is narrow, but the invitation is wide. And the interesting thing is this, is that Jesus would look at the, at the blind man, and he wouldn't say he's good or bad, necessarily, in, in terms of exclusively. What Jesus would say is, God's standard and you, and by the way, the you is put your own name there, okay? In this case, we'll put the blind man's name there. I don't know what it is, but we'll call him Fred, all right? There's God and Fred, and guess what, Fred? You come up short. Guess what, Fred? You know uh, all those Pharisees? who made such a big deal about you sinners, guess what? They come up short. But the shepherd who meets the standard lays his life down for the sheep and made up the gap. And so whoever follows the shepherd, whatever their background, black, white, male, female, east, west, murderer, adulterer, robber, fill in whatever thing in the blank that you want, gossiper, if you put your faith and trust in the shepherd who laid his life down for you, you receive eternal life. That's a pretty wide, a pretty wide. And now, in, 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 you know, the thing is, is that in, the, in the United States, and if you don't really get out of this bubble that we're in, you might think, you know what, we're just, we're just such a small part of the world. How can we claim to have this exclusive truth for the world? And I would say, you don't understand what's happening in the world. Right now, a third of the world, a third of the world is Christian, follows to follow Jesus. Pew Research did a study, and, and nobody really knows, but this is what they predict in 2050. It's already moving that way, okay? Now, listen to this. This is how wide the gate is. They predict 38% of the world's Christians will live in sub-Sahara Africa, 38% African. 23% in Latin America and the Caribbean, 16% in Europe, 13% in Asia and the Pacific, and only 10% of the world's Christians will live in North America. Now, that doesn't sound like a very narrow to me. That actually sounds really broad. It sounds like a worldwide faith that many people from many cultures can enter in. So yes, is Christianity narrow? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's narrow. You can't follow. If God is God and he created it all, then he gets to say what's right and wrong, period. Right? You can't, you can't, you can't broaden that and still have a God because if you broaden that, in essence what you're saying is we get to determine truth, which means we're God. 
Only the one who created it gets to determine what's true. Right? And that was the first thing we argued, right? If you want to know someone's purpose, look at what it was created for. On the other hand, it's broad. The invitation is broad. But we live in a world, at least in the West, we live in a world where truth is divine by your preference. It's, we're not looking for the truth. We're looking for what's your truth. Live your truth. Live your truth. Now, on one hand, there's a, there's a, there's a good part of living your truth in that, in that don't be following other fallen people like yourself. There's a healthy part of that. But the unhealthy part of that could be you get to determine what's right and wrong. You get to determine what makes you happy. You get to determine. No one else gets to, and it's very like you get to be your own God. And that is very unhealthy, especially because we know that when people follow their appetites and what makes them happy, it often captures them. It doesn't bless them at all. It promises that, but that's not what it delivers. So to kind of wrap things up, I want to talk about, I want you to think about this now. We we're thinking, or a place to think. I don't want you to take anything I'm saying at face value. Think about this. I want to talk about the hierarchy of truth. The hierarchy of truth. You see, the kind of truth you're looking for matters. And, and Malcolm was kind of talking about this in his illustration. The kind of truth you are looking for matters. So let me just give you, I, I just came up with some, what I can think of off the top of my head. There's probably a better example of this, um, but this is what I got, okay? So for instance, in my little triangle here, if you're, if you're trying to decide what to have for lunch after we're done today, food, okay? Right? Whatever. I mean, make sure it's thoroughly cooked or, you know, properly prepared. Or it might matter a little degree in terms of, you know, sickness or if you don't like certain spiciness or whatnot. But the, the answer to that question is probably as many people as there are in this room. Okay? And some of you can't even decide. It's even more than that. Right? And so when you talk about food, yeah, Ernie is going to want pizza. Okay? And I like pizza, but not as much as Ernie. Right? Somebody, somebody else might want to do some curry. Right? I like curry to a certain degree, but it's not my favorite thing. Some of you all are really brave and you eat raw fish. And I only like raw fish if it's fried. Okay? And so <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. My wife knows better than to ask what I want because I always say Mexican food 100% of the time. We don't eat Mexican food 100% of the time because she has her own opinion. No problem. No problem. It's vast and wide. And that's one of the things we like about the Bay Area, right? Is because it's vast and wide in terms of the offerings of food. Now, however, if you're trying to decide on your computer which search engine to use, okay, well, it probably isn't quite as broad as what food you want. There are some good search engines, you know, talking about Google and um, DuckDuckGo and Safari and whatever, okay? Um, there, there's some really good ones and there's some. There's some that don't protect you very well, right? And there's others that watch everything you do, right? And then, and then, and then like you, you one time look up, you know, a Nikes because you're thinking, you know, you have this cousin, you thought about giving him a Nike and then for the next six weeks in your feed, you know, Nike, Nike, and also you get emails in your email box, wouldn't you like these Nikes, and, yeah. right? So you might want to, when you pick your search engine, you might want to think a little bit more, but, but, there's a lot of good ones. There's a lot of good ones, but there's some bad ones, okay? Food, there's, I mean, if, you're, if it's really bad, they don't stay in business, right? So you can pretty much pick most places between here and there if you like the food. Search engine, you got to do a little bit more research, okay? But let's just say on your way home, let's talk about traffic. Okay, now you're trying to decide what's right or what's wrong, right? It gets a little bit more narrow because you just can't change lanes when you want to change lanes. Now, I know some of you do, but you shouldn't. You need to acknowledge there's some truth going on, and there's a car there. And preferably, you use your blinker, right? But it's a little bit more narrow. We can't, we can't all get to the intersection and go, you know what? My truth is that red does not mean stop. Now, we laugh, but that's in essence what some people are arguing it's like, no, we, we've, we've, we have to come to some agreement on what's true and what's not true. We gotta, it, it begins to narrow. And then, and then to, to Malcolm's illustration, let's say you have cancer. 
All right, let's say you have cancer. Now, I, I, if any of you have ever gotten sick with anything, right, you know that everybody has an opinion about how you can get better. Okay, they're going to tell you about, about diet. They're going to tell you about some, and, and everybody had a third cousin on their mother's side that got better because they did such and such, right? And, of course, we all say, well, you know, I, don't trust me on this, but I heard. And then the next thing they say, well, did you try Right? Because we're all convinced that whoever, however the cousin got, that that is it. We have all these opinions. But if you're the one with cancer, you're like, I need need to cut through this. And it matters. Now all these doctors and all this opinion, what are you doing? You're looking at the research. Right? And quite frankly, the research says this one takes five years (laughs) to maybe work. And this one takes one. uh, One? Right? Plus how many people? I don't know about, I don't know about you, but if, if one um, uh, procedure or drug has healed 14.3 million and another very new one has healed three, I'm like, you know what? If the 14.3 million one doesn't work, then I'll try in the three, but I'm starting with the 14.3 million one. Because it's cancer. Now, if it's a certain Mexican food downtown, I might go with the three. There may maybe some open new and whatever. I'll try it. Right? If it's, if it's a new search engine, I might, you know, I might do a little bit of kind of research and see what the better business says, and I might, I might try it, right? Traffic, maybe not so much, but when it comes to cancer, uh, my life isn't worth. So when we talk about truth and all these different ideas about people about, well, the truth, and you can't know the truth, or here is truth, or everybody's own truth, well, you, the first question you have to ask is, where is this thing I'm thinking about on the hierarchy of truth? If it's food, then they're, yeah, they're right. It's a preference. But breathing is not a preference. The fact that you need water is not a preference. There's just certain things about life that are not a preference. And you know what we found out in the pandemic? Social relationships, not a preference. It's not a preference. It's a need. Now, people might drive us crazy. We might still avoid people. But what we found out is we need them. We need these crazy, terrible, frustrating people in our lives. That's what we found out. And I think what we also found out is that spiritually, maybe things are a little bit higher on the scale. So here's the fundamental question. I don't think the fundamental question is, is is Christianity too narrow? I think the fundamental question is, what category do you put God into? What category do you put God into? If, if, if it's just a preference, then yes, Christianity is too narrow. Absolutely. However, if you believe what Jesus said, that he said, I, can, I am the cure. You are sick. You are separated from God. You are separated from your purpose. You are separated from true life. I am the cure. And I came that you may live. If you believe that, if you believe that, or, or, you, or you believe that you're sick, let's just say that you believe you're sick, then you have to begin to go, uh, in that category, you have to begin to say, well, then maybe it's a good thing it's narrow, because I don't want the broad solution. I want the narrow solution. The other roads may be easier, but the question is, do they result in the loss of life, ultimately, the destruction of life, ultimately, or ultimately death? And most of you all are old enough now. And if you're not, here's free advice. To know that the things you thought brought you life are often the things that take life. We, if, we, if we went back and said, man, I want to live, there's a lot of decisions we made that we thought brought life. We, we went for some good rather than the good. And I would say, if there, if there is a God and he is real, then it's like cancer. And you're going to ask yourself, you're not going to ask yourself, what kind of cure do I feel most comfortable with? Because when it comes to cancer, unfortunately, that one doesn't exist yet. Or what would you do? You would diligently seek out the truth about what actually treats whatever cancer you have the most effectively, no matter how hard it is because your life depends on it. The good news is this, and we'll talk more about this, is that though it is narrow and that Jesus is the way, and there is a truth, there is a right, and there is a wrong, it's also very broad. 
So like in Malcolm's illustration, that cancer treatment is for all. It's free. It's free. It's free. And I would say that's one of the major contrasts between uh, those who follow Jesus and, and many of the world's religions. Many of the world's religions say if you, if, you, if you want to be good and you want to be accepted, this is what you must do. And I know that, that for a lot of us, we've run into Pharisees, religious people, even in Christianity, that say that same thing. That is wrong. Dead wrong. But Christianity says you can't do it, so I did it. I laid my life down. I paid the price. I died for you. And, there, and, and do you try to live better? Yes, but you don't try to live better to deserve God's forgiveness. You try to live better you try to live better because you love him for what he did for you. And he begins to change your life. That's why we start following the rules. Not because if we don't, God's going to go, you're out of here. And that's a huge, huge difference. Now, the fundamental question then on that is who Jesus is. And we'll talk about that next week. All right? So I'm going to pray here, but after prayer, we're going to do a little Q&A. So if there's got a question or other people have that same question or comment, Please feel free to do so. But let me, let me pray for us. Dear God, um, everybody here knows I'm biased. I, I believe I am talking to you. I believe um, that, that uh, Jesus was your son, God in flesh, and that he laid his life down for me in all the ways that I come up short. Forgive me, Lord, if as one of the under-shepherds I have ever been more narrow than you, God. Forgive me for that. Forgive us, dear God, when we represent you that way. But thank you, Lord, A, for truth, that there is a truth that we can rely on. Um, but B, dear Lord, that <laughs> when we stumble and fall, your grace meets us right where we're at and leads us to the gate. And that's what I pray for, dear God. No matter where folks are, that you would more and more lead us to the gate, that we may go in and out freely, and that we may find that life that you're talking about. And like Kat was saying in the worship, it doesn't mean it's all going to be, be uh, roses right now, but if we can just have that hope we were talking about last week, and that assurance of that eternal life to come, I pray for that in each person's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.